You know, I got some feedback on my last Dresden Files review for White Knight where it was uh, something to the effect of it was kind of low energy, like I just wasn't enjoying it anymore because it wasn't the most positive of reviews or whatnot. And it led me to think even what I said in that video is I felt like maybe there was a little bit of burnout coming into the uh, Dresden Files. Uh, let me go ahead and tell you, that is not the case because uh, small favor, exactly what I was looking for to renew my interest. So let's talk about it now. Let's head to the Never Never. We're always disappointed when we find out someone else has human limits the same as we do. It's stupid for us to feel that way and we really ought to know better. But that doesn't seem to slow us down. Walls keep you from seeing things. They help make things less real. Sure, maybe you hear loud, sharp noises outside some nights, but it's easy to tell yourself that those aren't gunshots and there's no need to call the police. No need to even worry. It's probably just a car backfiring. Sure, or a kid with fireworks. There might be a loud wailing or screams coming from the apartment upstairs, but you don't know what that drunken neighbor is beating his wife with a rolling pin again. It's not really any of your business, and they're always fighting, and the man is scary besides. Yeah, you know that there are cars coming and going at all hours from your neighbor's place, and that the crowd there isn't exactly the most uptight-looking bunch, but you haven't seen them dealing drugs, not even to the kids you see going over there sometimes. It's easier and safer to just shut the door, be quiet, and turn up the TV. We are ostriches and the whole world is sand. It's amazing what you can get used to if your daily allowance of bazaar is high enough. Hey, what's up, Bookworms and Dresden fans? Mike back to talk more Dresden Files today, and we're talking about the 10th adventure with Harry Dresden. That is, of course, Small Favor by Jim Butcher. This is one I think that people have been uh, hyping me up for a little bit now. It, based off of the feedback they've heard from my reviews, they knew that Death Mask was an adventure that I really enjoyed. And they said, just wait till Small Favor. I think that's going to be one that you're really going to like. Uh, I'm going to let the cat out of the bag. Yes, that was very much the case. Uh, if that feels a little predictable, yeah, after you've watched uh, probably nine of these videos, you know exactly what it is I like about this series and which characters I like and which kind of story arcs that I like. So it's probably pretty easy to figure out which uh, episodes of this series that I'm going to like. But uh, I will say I was kind of uh, lukewarm on White Knight uh, and I did get some pleasant comments because of that. Uh, I always love the, maybe you just didn't understand. I mean... Again, that's a, that's a conversation for another time. But we just want to talk about this book now. We're talking about Small Favor. Um, small, a spoiler warning, if you guys don't know by now, I don't know why book 10 would be the first time you find me. But just in case, all of my Dresda Files reviews after books 1 and 2 have been spoiler heavy. I am going to tighten it up a little bit because I do feel like these videos are starting to get a little longer and they don't quite generate the discussion like a Wheel of Time video did or whatnot where I could justify making them a lot longer. So we're just going to get into it now. I just want to let you guys know if I leave out details, yeah, it's probably on purpose. Okay, I'm just trying to speed these things up. But uh, like I said, Death Mask has been my favorite up to this point, but this one is coming up on its rear, I think, because it's really really what I was looking for. And we begin with Harry spending more time with the Carpenter family. So right away, I love the Carpenters. They feel like they're my neighbors at this point. I love the whole family. I've even, Charity's even grown on me, much how Harry has kind of grown on Charity now. Uh, she's even kind of having fun with them. They're having a snowball fight. She even puts, uh, you know, snow down the back of his shirt. It's like, okay, this is, this is great. He's just like one of the family now. Uh, but they are attacked, of course, because nothing ever is happy for long in Harry's life. It's something that Joss Whedon once said about Buffy the Vampire Slayer. He used to say is when Buffy is happy, the show is pretty good. When Buffy is miserable, the show is amazing. And I kind of feel the same way with this. Whenever Harry's happy, eh, it's fine. It's fine. I'm happy for him. But uh, when Harry is miserable and getting the crap beat out of him, the this this, this series is usually pretty awesome. So anytime he's going to get attacked in chapter one, I'm on board. And one thing I can say about this series that's been so consistent is Jim Butcher knows how to get you hooked from the beginning. Because at first I was going to be like, the Billy Groats gruff, huh? That's where we're going with this. But <laughs> he does it in his usual charming way that it works. So yes, they are attacked by the Billy Groats gruff, the children's story. Uh, but um, 
Harry does discover that they were creatures of fairy. They use uh, iron on them and, and there's weakness to it. So he wants to know, why is fairy after me now, right? That's a question I ask every time fairies show up. Uh, but uh, we get an amusing scene with Bob. And I, I, I feel like I have said I wish that we got more Bob in these books because he's so entertaining. But I also think that less is more with a character like Bob when he only shows up once in a while, has his good history lesson and his funny moment with this one. It's about, you know, reading the romance novels and he, he's so excited. He's almost ripping the pages as he's, he's reading these, these smut novels or whatnot. Always entertaining. But uh, here, I just love what he's just basically making fun of Harry for getting attacked by the Billy Groats Grove. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's just something that if they ever do a faithful adaptation of this series, that's uh, something that I think needs to really hit home is how Bob can just bust Harry's chops so well. Uh, but... Um, yeah, so the Billy Groats Gruff, that's not where I expected this one to go, right? I was like, oh, that's that's interesting, but I'm, I'm liking it. You know, you got the Billy Groats Gruff with uh, with automatic weapons. That's a, that's a very nice little twist there. Uh, but Harry does have another meeting with Queen Mab in this one. I've been waiting for this because, like, you know, what was that, four or five books ago where he had to make the, the, the three promises uh, that he has to keep to her or whatever, three favors? And so she has come calling now for favor number two. But things are a bit different now she's not talking she's letting she's talking through a uh a, i think it's called a malk a malk uh that it's called grimalkin and uh so yeah the fae continue to be confusing to me and this is something that's going to kind of kind of be a theme of this episode is where i talk about all the stuff with fairy that i don't get but not in the way i know some people have not liked that i said i feel like the fa the fae stuff gets kind of convoluted sometimes uh that's just a personal thing. I, I think that the vampire courts are more prevalent, but it's just because I prefer vampire lore over fairy lore. That's all. That's all that is or whatever. So uh, I really just, I struggle to understand what's going on with the, the fairy in this, the fae in this books because, and it's ever since proven Guilty, I've just been completely lost of what's going on with them. And I'll talk about that as we keep going. But she has come to collect on the second of the three favors that Harry owes. And she wants uh, her him to rescue Johnny Marcone, who has been abducted. And um, Harry does his usual, no way, I'm not doing it. And then, you know, he finds a way that, you know, look, there's only so many times I'm going to ask you this stuff. And you're going to eventually realize you don't have a choice. You're going to do it. So, you know, there's a whole seduction and all that kind of stuff that Mav always does. But um, basically, she does offer him again the winter night roll, which this time Harry is very tempted. He thinks about it for a minute, which is more than usual, I think. Usually he's just been like, you know, get lost right away. This time he, he starts really thinking about it, but, uh, you know, never to the point where I'm like, oh man, he might actually do it. I don't think we've seen the end of this. I think that the fact that this roll is still open this many books later, uh, something big is coming for it. And there's an ice cream truck driving by my window right now. Gotta love the suburbs, right? Oh my. But, uh, all right. So like I said, the fairy continued to be very, very confusing. Uh, but they follow a lead from Miss Demeter to a safe house. And then, of course, another attack. So one thing I'll say about this book, guys, nonstop action. And I think that's the case with most of these books. But where I felt like White Knight was the first one that had a real lull in it, this one, no. It's pretty much, uh, okay, it's been 30, it's been 30 pages time for some shit to blow up i think that's where uh where butcher was at with this one and, and it's very welcome here i don't need non-stop action but it's always welcome you know that's how i feel about it uh but uh he, they're fighting it's, it's a denarian so right off the bat I'm like, oh yes yeah, more we're getting back to the denarians that's what i want i figured when people told me that i was gonna like this book it was gonna deal with nicodemus and the denarians and and the uh and the knights of the cross because that's been my favorite stuff of the series so far but uh, they're attacked again uh uh there's a denarian that harry calls mantis girl <laughs> And it just made me think about how much his nicknames amuse me. It's almost kind of like a Sawyer, what Sawyer did on Lost, where he always had like quick, snappy nicknames for everybody. Something I felt like uh, Tony Stark started doing in the MCU movies later. But it really, for me, it's, it's kind of hilarious to me because it's something my wife has done since uh, we've been together is she'll find a character in a series. I'll be like, who are you talking about? Are you talking about this char character? And you're like, yeah, no, I'm talking about like Bumblebee Man. And it's because the guy had like a yellow and black shirt on. And that's just how she, st she just names these characters, just random stuff like that. And it just, I don't know, it's amusing to me. It's a personal thing. So whenever Harry comes up with one of these uh, silly little nicknames for a character, it always makes me chuckle. Uh, but um, they have a fight. Thomas kills one of her companions, drops the, denar the, denar the, the coin, and Thomas picks it up. I'm like, oh shit, this is gonna get crazy, right? But uh, you know, he was wearing gloves, so he's good. But um, 
he asks her to turn over Marcone, and she's like, "Well, I'll have to, I'll have to talk to my superiors." And I think, "Okay, her superior is Nicodemus. Let's get to it. Let's go. Let's go. I'm excited." Uh, but um, on the way back, the, Thomas is kind of asking, "Wait, wait, wait, wait." So he, the, the 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 nails in the sword hilts. Okay, crucifixion. I got that. Are you saying that these thirty co silver coins are like the thirty silver coins? And, and coins. I say coins. Coins. <laughs> Whenever my dialect messes up, people always call me out for it in the comments. So, what's it's coins, not corns. Obviously, I know it's coins. <laughs> uh, but uh, Thomas is like, oh, okay, well that's that's neat and all, but I'm not worried about temptation. My whole life is temptation. That's not going to really bother me. And here he kind of puts it on a level that he'll explain uh, temptation in a way like they would be able to give you Justine back if you wanted. And then Thomas understands. And I'm thinking, Harry, what are you doing, dude? <laughs> That seems awfully of a foolish of a thing to say to him. Uh, didn't come back in this book, but who knows? Because there are some coins that are, um, you know, not really accounted for at the end of this. So um, there's a little something to think about headed forwards. But um, back at Michael's, we get to see Sonya again, one of the Knights of the Cross. And uh, we get his, 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 uh, his backstory. I believe this is the first time he showed up since Death Mask. We get some of his backstory where, you know, he's a, a black man in Russia. He was really alienated and he found compassion from a denarian named Rosanna who gave him the coin of Magog before he met Shiro and Michael and took up Asparachius. So it was really good stuff, man. I love this kind of development for some of these secondary characters because I don't feel like he throws so much at you at once and he gives you a little bit at a time. And both him and Michael get some interesting development in this one in ways that I wasn't really expecting. Uh, but Sonya asks Harry if he's going to take up Shiro's sword, and he says, "No, I'm not that guy. That's just not. That's just not me. It's not gonna be that guy." And at this point, I still have my theories or whatnot. One of my theories was this is gonna be Murphy, and they kind of tease that in this book, but it doesn't turn out to be that. It doesn't look like. Um, I don't really have any other guesses at the moment, but I'll get into that when I talk about my final thoughts. But uh, he does discover that Shiro was a descendant of kings, and so is Sonya. So I'm thinking, does this mean that Michael is everybody who has one of these swords a descendant of kings? Uh, so does this mean? I, I mean, I don't know. Is it, uh, someone that has to be royalty for him to give this sword to? Uh, I, don't, I just really didn't think it was going to be this long with that sword, and this plot still kind of hanging there. But I'm glad it is. I'm glad it is. I. I'm not one of those that's like, oh, I can't believe he's drugging on this long. Things like that, I'm glad. I mean, he's had this sword for five years now and still doesn't know what to do with it. So, uh, you're going to slow burn it? That's great. That's fine with me. Uh, to me, it doesn't feel like something, okay, I got to know. This isn't a will they, won't they kind of situation. Like, it, it had been in danger of getting that way with Harry and Murphy before they talked about it like adults. And it, it's fine with it not happening. But, um... I don't know, I'll come back to the sword stuff again. Final thoughts, I'm going to talk about the swords. I'm going to talk about the the uh, the, the lineage, things like that. But uh, Michael and Harry, they have several angry discussions or just kind of some tense moments. Like at once, Harry even thinks about punching him in the face. Uh, Michael's really being cold. He doesn't really understand why. Uh, he thinks maybe it's because he keeps telling Michael to, to stop being stupid because, you know, you could die and your family needs you. And so like that, it just really seems to rub Michael the wrong way. But I feel like there's something more going on there. And I'm thinking, well, is this all about the whole last year on the coin thing is, was, was kind of my theory or whatnot. But, uh, I don't know, it's, it's kind of really tense. And I don't like it when my two favorite characters are fighting, you know, <laughs> that bothers me. But um, they talked about uh, having a, a meeting with, uh, with the Denarians and Harry asked Lucio to set up a meeting with Ivy as a mercenary, or the emissary. Mer I, see, I see Kincaid and I think mercenary. So uh, obviously Kincaid's coming back there. And uh, I thought that Kincaid would have a big, I don't know, when he showed back up, I thought he'd have a bigger role, uh, especially with the whole kind of things with him and Murphy. But that's okay. That's okay. There's enough going on in this book. And I said that's something that I love that Butcher does, is he has these characters that will disappear for two or three books. And even if they do show back up, there's not a ton for him to do, but it just makes it feel like a living, breathing world when he doesn't force all of his characters in every single book. And then when he has one show up, it's not just because, hey, I'm going to write a bunch about this this time. They're just sometimes they show up. I like that. I like that a lot. I know some people might not think that's a big deal, but when you got a world that's just continuing to grow as big as his world is, those are big deals to me. So I am enjoying it. I think he's growing his world at a perfect rate right now. So this meeting takes place with Nicodemus and he brings up Lashiel and also knowing that there is some dark workings within the White Council, the Black Council as Harry refers to it as. 
I think this is part of the reason why I like Nicodemus so much as a villain, because of things like what he does here. He tries to work the temptation angle. He tries to be intimidating. He tries to basically play both sides. You know, he, he, he just brings up ideas of, you know, propaganda that, that, that the church is and the council is just as much propaganda as any other side. So it's kind of things I'm saying like, am I really the bad guy or am I just the worst bad guy? I love stuff like that, my villains. It makes them not necessarily relatable, but it makes what they're doing make sense. And yeah, every time this guy is on screen, uh, I'm just, I'm just, I'm riveted I, on screen. But um, any, any of you guys like have a, a, a imaginary actors in your head for these? I can't stop thinking about Tobin Bell. That's the guy who played Jigsaw in, in, in the Saw movies. Tobin Bell is Nicodemus. Anyway, that's what I picture in my head. Anyways, that's a fan casting would be a whole fun episode, wouldn't it? Uh, but uh, it's when Harry brings up the attack on Arctis Tor that Nicodemus actually seems to like break character, I guess you'd say. And he just like, he's pretty much one step away from actually attacking Harry. He gets really upset. And again, I'm like, why do I feel like everyone knows what's going on with the fairy, the fairy except me? Everyone understands what's going on with him. I, I feel like, I almost feel like I missed a book or something. Anyhow. I know I'm gonna get grilled in the comments if I really did miss it. I just I'm really confused. I'm really confused about the fairy. Uh, but Harry realizes this meeting was all just a charade for them to uh, the Denarians to abduct Ivy because they want to present her with a blackened coin. And it's uh, yeah that would be very bad because she's like one of the most powerful beings in the universe and she would probably be hell on earth if she got one of these coins, right? So it makes it makes a lot of sense. At first I was like that kind of came out of nowhere, but I'm like. But it makes sense. It really does. But there's a fight that ends with Ivy being taken and Kincaid being injured very, very badly. And um, what do you take a shot in this book if it happens? One, if Harry says, I am, I, I am a, a chivalrous by nature. If he explains that he doesn't like women getting hit or he doesn't want to hit a woman or how he believes in chivalry or he wakes up after a fight. <laughs> Every time Harry wakes up, take a shot and you'll be smashed by act two for sure. So as they gear up for the final act, um, Michael reveals that they have recovered 24 of the 30 coins. And then the last six coin holders are in Chicago right now. So they could end this. He thinks my journey could be over. I could spend more time with my family. I could go to my kids t-ball games, things like that. And I'm like, wow, that's that's actually pretty awesome. I, you know, as much as I like these villains, the Denarians, I was like, okay, if this is the end of their story, I feel like I'm satisfied with it or whatnot, but I'm kind of glad that it isn't. But it was a really neat idea for, you know, the 10 pages that Butcher let me believe it. So uh, Harry comes up with the wild plan to trade the coins and Phytolacheus. Is it Phytolacheus or Phytolacheus? I say Phytolacheus. Uh, trade those for Ivy. And uh, they're not happy about it, but, you know, they don't want to see... Either, either a little girl getting hurt or Ivy, like I said earlier, just being a just demon on earth, basically. So Nicodemus suggests to Harry that his friends think that he has been turned and that they do not trust him. And he has noticed that they've been kind of talking about him in other rooms and stuff and kind of whispering to themselves. And Harry speaks with Michael about it, you know, basically has him put uh, Amaracius like to his throat and says, you know, if there's something that you need to talk to me about, let's talk about it. Let's talk it out right now. And Michael tells him that, um, or he tells Michael that Lashiel is no longer in his head. And Michael's like, I ain't buying that shit. Uh, but it basically says that no one has ever banished the shadow of the fallen without taking up the coin. So even though it may be letting you think that, it's probably not the case. And I even said last review that it was last review or two reviews ago, can't remember, uh, that uh, I don't believe Last Shell's really gone. I just felt like it was way too much building and way too quick of an ending for that. And plus, you've seen these people who've had these coins for a millennia, and, and, and Harry's just going to kind of get rid of them that fast? Mm, I'm having a hard time believing that. So um, Harry says he's fine until Michael asks him, okay, where's your blasting rod? And Harry can't remember. And I started thinking, Shoot, I I guess I didn't even notice he didn't have it. Uh, so either really good writing or I just completely missed it, which both is possible. But he last remembers having it in the conversation with Mab and realizes his mind has been manipulated. And they're like, we know. We had Molly dive into your mind while you were unconscious to verify it. So uh, I, I can understand where he feels like he might have felt like a little bit of a betrayal. But he also understands, hey, we got we to gotta cover our asses here. So good character moment. 
Before I get to the last fight here, I want to talk about the Harry and Lucio romance. While I don't know if I'm really into it, um, I'm glad my dude Harry is deciding not to be celibate anymore because I'm thinking, bro, it's been, what, five, six years? And the last one is like when you had a vampire tied up. <laughs> uh, I, I just, I, it might not seem like a big deal to other readers. To me, I was like, Yo, do you know what it's like to go five years? No, no, you shouldn't know what it's like to go five years in your sexual prime. That is very, very, very bad for everyone around you and for your mental state. So, uh, yeah, five years. I'm just glad that Harry is getting... You know, it doesn't explicitly state that that's what's going to happen, but I think you're supposed to pretty much assume that's what's it's on its way to happen. They just kiss here, but in, you know, at the very end, it insinuates that it's leading to the next big thing, right? So... Uh, even Murphy calls him out later and says, I don't really think that uh, you guys are right together, which, you know, I don't know if that's jealousy or if, you know, that's her being a good friend. I think it could be a little bit of both because I know she cares about Harry. I don't think she cares about Harry that way, right? Well, I don't know. I don't know. I still think it's going to happen eventually. You can you can say all the right things for years and then eventually it's just what's going to be is going to be. Heart wants what the heart wants, right? So the trade's going to happen on a small island in Lake Michigan and Harry thinks that it seems really familiar, like he's been here before. And doesn't really come back to that until the very, very end. But predictable chaos. Predictable chaos everywhere. And Michael dual wields Amarakis and Phytalakis at one point. And he's just, dude, just a G. He is badass. There's a fight earlier in the book where he basically goes all hand of God. Just like just smiting everyone. He's, he's just awesome. He's just awesome. I love this character so much. Not just because he's so good at his dialogue. But when it, it's time to throw down, man can throw down, right? But, uh... I started thinking right here, you know, he's teased about killing Michael a couple of times now. Is he going to do it again or is he actually going to do it? Uh, Harry goes to free Ivy and Marcone and he's cornered by Nicodemus before reinforcements arrive. Miss Guard, Hendrix, and Lucio arrive uh, from Apocalypse Now, basically, because we got a full helicopter with Flight of the Valkyries playing. And I just, I just assume sometimes Butcher is writing while he's got the TV on and he's like, hey, uh... Apocalypse Now is on. Let me just write this in. <laughs> but he could just be like me. And he just loves, you know, a good pop culture reference. Again, these are things I think make Dresden Files the charming romp that it is, is these pop culture references, especially since I know most of them. But uh, the helicopter is hit and Michael is shot after Tessa takes Harry's gun from his hand. And I'm just like, no, because it just insinuates he's dead. He is dead instantly. So, I mean, for the last three chapters I'm reading, and just assuming that Michael is dead. You know, that's that's where I was and whatnot. And like I said, this is my favorite secondary character here. I'm, I'm, I'm crushed. I'm crushed at this point. But Harry, he loses his shit, understandably. He blasts and Tessa, Tessa with some, uh, some, some like super fire before he runs. And Magog gives chase, but Magog is killed swiftly by the eldest gruff who has come for harry i kind of glazed over this gruff a little bit he does show up numerous times in here once murphy even like badasses this dude out of mcnally's pub in a really good scene uh, basically uh, he's duty bound he doesn't want to fight harry but he's duty bound to fight harry here because of the whole fairy stuff and you know fix showed up the uh, the summer night he showed up earlier and told harry to remember the uh the leaf that was either lily or T titania gave him in Proving guilty, I can't remember which, but I'm glad that he showed up and reminded me about that because I'd already forgot. I'd already forgot about this little relic. But um, this scene, to me, is what makes Dresden Files what it is. And if you've read this, you probably know what I'm talking about. Levity in the face of danger. Such everything that I loved about what Buffy did is it always had the right quip that didn't seem like no one would say that in this situation. And it just is always so well placed and uh, i mean we know that harry's got no shot versus the elder gruff you know he's killed three senior council wizards uh so he uses the leaf to make the gruff go and get him a donut and this is just gold it go and get me a fresh donut with right frosting and sprinkles <laughs> just classic jim butcher that's what i'm calling it just a classic jim butcher trope i love it i think it's one of the most amusing entertaining chapters he has written through these first 10 books. I loved it. I know some people are like, that's the point where I'm like, oh, it's just too hokey for me. I'm like, how did you make it this far and that's too hokey for you? Because that that was brilliant. I loved it. 
So uh, Harry is confronted on the fo- on the boat back to Chicago by Nicodemus and Nic- Nicodemus Nicodemus, and uh, he tells uh, he tells Lashiel to incapacitate Harry, and Harry freezes up. And I'm thinking he's playing with him, right? And then I'm like, oh, well, I don't know. I, I did think that Lashiel still you know got possession of him, but um, Harry plays it up, and then he ends up choking Nick with the with the noose tie, like he did in Death Masks again, and once again. Splash! There goes Nicodemus into the water, you know, running away to uh, to to live the fight again another day. So I'm happy he's coming back. Most likely, uh, I don't know if he has at this point. Like I said, at this point I'm only five books behind, so I might not have come back yet. But the day, I mean, no body, no death is always going to be the rule in these types of, of books. But uh, I, I love the line. Um, I'm sorry, Lashiel doesn't live here anymore. Just God, these are such good quips. I love them. I love them. But um, he gets back to the hospital. Michael is in surgery. And Harry goes to the chapel in the hospital to beg God to save his life. And he just ends up getting angry and just yelling at it. And it's a pretty powerful scene. And he's interrupted by a man named Jake, a janitor. And he tells him of Harry about a helping hand. Uh, he gives Harry a beaten up paperback of The Two Towers by J.R.R. Tolkien with a dog-eared page with the quote, The burned hand teaches best, underlined. And then he disappears. So I'm like, Okay, what was that all about? And I was like, is this what all the, the, the jokes when I joked about it, how Jim Butcher would make a janitor be important in the story? I guess this is what all those jokes were about in those comments. But um, I, I'm completely like blown away. I don't understand what's going on, but we get Mab there to uh, that takes his place where he was. And now she actually does speak and says that uh, Jake was actually the angel Uriel. Is it Uriel or Uriel? Uriel. I was saying Uriel. Um, now, like I said, I get the janitor jokes, okay? But she gives Harry back his blasting rod and says that he's, if he does not accept the White Knight position, she is going to tempt Thomas for this role because she thinks that he might want some revenge. And that's... Dude's already in the wild hunt. Why not? Why not? I could actually see that one happening. But he does remind... She does remind Harry he does still owe her one favor, and it's going to be happening soon. So Michael is going to make it, but the injuries are severe. And like I said, I thought Butcher had killed him off. Um, you know, it's pretty much sounds like his days as a knight are done. Like he might not even walk again. I don't know. He might be paralyzed. Don't even know. But, uh, you know, Sonya does give Amarakis to Harry to, uh, to basically, he's now the guardian of two swords with no one to wield them. Uh, he does it once again. He presents the idea to Murphy. Uh, she did actually wield uh, Fidelechius in that fight, you know, so she's, it seems like she's worthy, I guess you'd say. If this is like Thor's hammer, she's worthy because uh, the light, you know, the, the, the sword like lit up and all that kind of stuff. And again, that's why I just imagine these things as like lightsabers. <laughs> but uh, she, again, she declines, and it just seems like no one really wants this role. And they keep on saying that Harry's going to know who's supposed to get these swords. But the story ends with Lucio and Harry going to dinner, and we presume ending Harry's dry spell so uh final thoughts here like i said the fairy i'll probably have a dozen comments below about how stupid i am because i don't get it but i still have no idea what is going on with the fade right now like at all ever since proving guilty ever since arctis tour i felt like i've missed a book somewhere in here and i'm am i supposed to be conf- am i supposed to be confused right now that's the question am i supposed to be or did I actually miss something? Or is this something from the short story collections? Because I really feel like I'm confused and I don't know if I'm supposed to be. So I asked on the Discord, am I supposed to be this confused about it? And they said, yes, at this point you are. But, you know, I'll always have uh, someone in the comments telling me what an idiot I am because I haven't read, you know, the next five books, I guess. Uh, the swords, this is the big one. Does lineage matter? Uh, Shiro said Harry would know who to give Fidel like used to. And we know that. And we've had it confirmed that the previous owners have all descended from royalty. You know, Shiro was from uh, uh, Shao Tai, which was the uh, what the last king of Okinawa. And Sonya descends from Saladin. We get that confirmed in this one. That's the first sultan of Egypt. And I believe in the ending there, Molly verified that Michael has defen- descended from Charlemagne, which, as we know, is the uh, one-time emperor of Europe. So um, Murphy was able to use the sword. So, I mean, does that mean she's descended from royalty? These are good questions, man. Does this mean Harry should get on the phone with Prince William? <laughs> is, that who, is that who the sword's supposed to go to? I, I don't know. Good stuff. Good stuff. Lots to think about there. As, uh, Uriel, I want to say, Harry is now able to manifest something called soul fire. Soul fire, right? 
And the clues in the Two Tower book made me assume it was a gift bestowed upon Harry for being able to resist Lashiel. That's kind of how I interpreted it. But uh, Bob did warn Harry if he uses too much of it, his soul will run dry. And uh, you know Harry, and I know Harry. He'll find a way to do that. But I am looking forward to finding out more about Uriel going forward, I hope. Lastly, the Black Council. You know, Nicodemus suggests that there are Denarians within the council at this point, even though he, even he doesn't know who they are. So uh, Harry had collected a lot of those coins uh, and they had been they got stolen from. You know, uh, even he even Nicodemus uh, presumes that someone actually uh, picked his pocket. Uh, what was his name? Oh gosh, can't think of the name. Anyhow, the the one that might have actually taken it. But uh, could this be the same Denarian that has presumably infiltrated the council? Because is the council in control of these coins? Do they know this at this point? I mean, there's so many theories going on there. Uh, I presented my Cal theory last episode, and it got a lot of giggles. So uh, I, I guess I was far off on that. I, I'm new to the whole uh, guessing who things are, but I'm getting close enough now where I guess a lot of these don't have answers yet. So uh, that's kind of where we're at. But um, like I said, yeah, so many theories right now. I could be keep going with some of these, but really the big one for me is who's going to take up these swords and, um, yeah, who, who obviously is the mole or moles within the council. That's obviously the biggest storylines going from book to book at this point right now. But guys, I really enjoyed this one. Um, I was in fear with burnout, like I said, with White Knight, but I guess not because I had the usual fun with this one. And I would probably put small favor in my top five of the first 10 that I've read so far. Uh, I'm not ready to do that list just yet, but you know, uh, Two-thirds of the way through the currently released books here, uh, I still haven't had a bad book. I like. I, I, it sounds like that when I say that about White Knight, but if you listen to a review, I really wasn't that down on the book. It just was the first one I said I didn't find myself lost in, like I usually am, like I was with this one, and like I already am with Turn Code, about 100 pages in. So, guys, that's where I am at. Did you like Small Favor? Do you want to talk about it? Hit me in the comments. Let's talk about these things. But try to keep it just these first 10 books. Tell me what you were thinking at this point, if you've already read ahead, and try not to spoil it for me in the comments. But uh, I appreciate you guys watching and listening and telling me what a moron I am for not understanding the fairy thing, and I will talk to you in the comments.